I'm not sure how to start or where to start. I can't even be sure that what I'm about to say is real. It feels so much like a horrifying dream that sometimes I tell myself that it was. It had to have been. But the scars on my leg tell a different story. They remind me every time I shower or get dressed or see my skin that it happened. It was real. I spend so much time making excuses for why I won't, can't wear shorts, why I don't want to get into the pool or have anyone see me come from the shower, that it's exhausting, lie upon lie. I'd have been better off lying about some made-up accident from my childhood, something so bad that it scarred me so deeply that one can't help but pull back from repulsion when they see it. But I don't want people to think I'm crazy. Then I worry, what if I did make up a story and someone asked my mother and father about it? It's just best to continue saying that I have a skin condition or I'm allergic to the sun. One day, 15 years ago, my leg was fine. And the next, it wasn't. One hour, 15 years ago, my leg was fine. And the next, it wasn't. 45 seconds before, 15 years ago, my leg was fine. Until... It wasn't. Hey, Chuck, you there? Came over the radio. It was a slow night. The fog had rolled in, dampening the air, pushing out most sounds. One could barely hear the ships off in the distance blowing their horns. The light from the lighthouse, nearly crushed by the thickness of the gray mist curling up from the sea, swirling around anything that didn't move, sliding up and over the rooftops, whooshing by the street lamps, silently dimming them until they looked like barely lit birthday candles flickering in a dream. Yep, right here, Bob. What's up? I was in my patrol car sitting in the 7-Eleven parking lot. When it got real slow, this was the place to be. They'd let me use their restroom and give me free coffee, and tonight I needed that coffee. The denseness of the fog, the visibility being mere inches from my nose, the eerie quiet was a good way to lull a man to sleep, and this was my first job straight out of college in my hometown. I couldn't afford to get caught sleeping on the job. The police chief was my uncle on my mom's side. Here, everyone knew everyone when the summer tourists weren't here. All my siblings and both of my parents had all been taught by the same first grade teacher. Heck, she'd probably teach my kids one day. Yeah, Chuck, we got some sort of signal coming off the eagle's nest. Looks like an SOS. Off eagle's nest, huh? How'd that happen? Someone beat a yacht? Probably. Some rich daddy's girl probably got her dad's boat wedged up on the rocks off the cliff. Well, shit. What do you need me to do? Can you maybe take the Caps dinghy out there and check it out? It's only coming twice, but I can't see the good in ignoring it. Yeah, I suppose so. Tell Mom that I'll be a little late, will ya? Hey, there's life jackets out there, right? Sure. I hear she's making a pot roast, and I'm bringing Jenny Crowder with me. Yeah, there's two under the seat. Jenny Crowder, huh? I thought she was moving to New York. Gonna be on Broadway. Well, you know how it goes. Can't stand to leave me. I laughed. My uncle was an unwilling bachelor, but seeing as how he'd known every eligible woman in town since he was in diapers, or they'd changed his at some point, the... 
Pickens were pretty slim. I drove to the dock, slowly. Anything could jump right out in front of you and you'd hit it before you even saw it. Pulled up, got my jacket out of the trunk, first aid kit, some gloves, a blanket, a compass, and a flashlight, and headed to the dinghy. I couldn't see it, but I could hear her gently rocking up against the dock. It made a soft ting every so often. That helped me get my bearing straight as to where the dock was. It was cold. Never felt fog so cold in my life, even after. Never. Anyway, I untied the dinghy, placed my things in it, and got in. The compass of my own knowledge of the place told me to head off going northwest. I rode the dinghy, and the noise of the oars slapping the water surface as they cut through the black water was the only thing that could be heard except for some far-off tankers blowing horns. It was eerie, I can tell you that much, and I didn't want to be there, not even a little bit. Suddenly the tiny boat came to a lurching stop nearly throwing me out of her. I couldn't see a thing except for the thickest fog you'll ever see. It swirled like pipe smoke but was so dense that it looked like a white brick wall. I didn't know what I'd hit but I figured it must be some rocks jutting out. I wasn't too far off the coastline so I paddled the boat backwards and turned her a bit more east and was immediately stopped again. I crawled up to the front and dipped my hand into the frigid water to try and get a feel for the size of the rock I was dealing with. No point in using a flashlight. And instead of the jagged edge of a rock, my hand came up against the hull of a ship. I guessed that I'd found the source of the SOS. I settled myself back onto my seat and hollered, Hello! Anyone on board? I'm Officer Charles Daniels, and I'm coming on board. I listened, and there was nothing. Again I hollered, Hello? Can you hear me? My name is Officer Charles Daniels, and I'm boarding you. I positioned myself in the dinghy to be parallel to the ship. I felt along as I pulled the dinghy by putting my hands on the ship to find a place to board. In the dense fog, I caught the faintest blue writing. It read, Eva Maria. I got on my radio and called back to Bob. Hey, Bob. I found her. She's northwest of the captain's dock. The name is Eva Maria. Chuck, you okay? Bob responded. Yeah, I'm good. I'm going to board. I haven't heard anyone and no one has answered me when I called out. Hey, Chuck, did you say that Eva Maria? The radio was cutting out real bad and I could hardly make out what Bob was saying. Right, Eva Maria. Then there was just static. I tried for a few minutes to get him back on the radio, mostly because it felt so eerie to be out in that fog with no way to contact anyone. It was then that I heard her. At first I thought the waves were making the small ship scrape against a rock. It sounded so much like metal being scraped so loudly that it scared me as if I'd been physically punched in the gut. The jolt of hearing such a noise when it had been so silent, the fog so dense. But then I heard it again, and realized that it was a woman's voice screaming. I quickly scrambled up the steel ladder on the side of the ship, crawled over the rusty railing, cutting my palm on a piece of rust that was lifting off. I took out my flashlight and entered the helm. There was nothing there, and... I do mean nothing. No papers, no maps, charts, chairs, nothing. I walked down the hallway, 
peered into the head. The toilet handle was covered in rust, and the sink appeared to have blood dripping from the counter onto the floor. I followed the drips while calling out, Hello? Hello? I'm Officer Daniels. Is there anyone here? The screams had stopped and were now sounding like muffled sobbing. My radio began to crackle. Chuck. Chuck. And then only a syllable here or there. I tried answering back, but there was nothing. I turned into the galley where the blood became thick. It was a deep red in nearly parallel lines. I knew that someone was injured badly. The galley was dark. The stove looked ancient. The stools too. In fact, I'd only seen a galley this old in pictures when I was a child. I couldn't understand how this was a working vessel. I moved my light around the room, looking into the corners, the open cabinets, doors falling off. The sound was quite muffled now, but I could still hear it. It's... Uh, I'm Officer Daniels. I started when just then, the beam from my flashlight hit her face. Her skin as white as paint, her eyes sunken and gray, her nose thin and bony, and her hair ratted. Dear God, I began. As she reached out, I caught a glimpse of her hands, dripping with blood her nails nearly torn away from her fingertips, the bones sharp and visible at the tips, her skin, that pale skin, her veins blue, and as she somehow managed to throw her body in my direction, I fell back against the stove and saw her legs, or what was left of her legs. I'll never forget the bloody stumps, the skin and muscle degloved from the bone, the tendons stringy and white, the bloody flesh dangling along the floor. She screamed as though the noise was coming up from hell through her lungs and out her cracked lips. I will admit that I screamed too. Her long, thin hands grabbed hold of my calf as I was backing out of the room. Those fingers felt like razor blades tearing through my skin down to my ankle. I... I ran through the ship and down the ladder. Whatever had happened in that ship was something that I wasn't prepared to see alone. On that night, I heard a foghorn off in the distance. At least I thought it was distant. As thick as the fog was, it could have been mere yards away, and the sound would have been muffled so much that I couldn't tell. I couldn't have guessed with my mind in the state it was in. I grabbed my radio as it crackled and I saw blue and red lights coming out from the fog slowly. On my radio I heard, Chuck, I'm nearly there. Chuck? I could see the Coast Guard coming closer. I turned my flashlight towards them in hopes that they could see some bit of the light. I could hear the men yelling that they saw me, that they saw something. And that's when I heard Bob. Chuck, stay in the dinghy. 
that Ava Maria sank 30 years ago, said Bob. Lost all her crew and the captain's wife. They was all chewed up. Crackle, crackle went the radio. To this day, I won't go out to the sea. Not ever. Thank you for coming to my channel. If you're not already and you'd like to be, and why wouldn't you? Please subscribe. Please give this video a thumbs up. It's totally free and it really helps my channel out. And if you'd like to share this story, that'd be awesome too. If you'd like to be notified when new content goes up or we go live with a podcast, go ahead and click that bell. Thank you. And good night.